So, um, I, my name is Professor Thorsten Passi and I'm a professor of psychiatry and psychotherapy in Germany at uh, Hanover Medical School and uh, another institution. Mm. And uh, I have been interested in uh, psychedelic drugs and altered states of consciousness of different uh, origin since 40 years meanwhile. And uh, I have conducted research in that uh, realm for like 30 years, including clinical uh, studies with different psychedelic substances and other means of uh, inducing altered states of consciousness. What was your interest in the mind before then? What really, what really got you even moving this direction in life? So <clears throat> I was a kind of nature scientist and an atheist uh, at mm. first. And um, then I began uh, to study um, philosophy mm. and I was um, doing fishing and looking at floats for hours and uh, in this uh, context I got a mystical experience spontaneously and uh, being, being one with nature and having great uh, feelings and uh, very elaborate kind of thoughts and uh, so I, uh, this was a kind of life transforming experience but uh, in a harsh sense so I needed a kind of three years to integrate that experience wow. because it irritated my view, world view in such a fundamental way mm. that I was completely irritated. I even had to um, get psychotherapy to integrate that one experience, which I have immediately felt to be the most worthful experience a human can get. That mm. was an intuition or an, an immediately immediate recognition. Worthy experience, you say, a uh, good experience. Yeah, it was yes. a mystical experience yes. of being one with nature and stuff yes. like that and it was very uh, impressive and so therefore I had a um, 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 an life transforming uh, process going on and uh, later on uh, because I studied, I was a philosopher at that point and so I began to study about mystical experience and what they mean and what their implications are and later on how they can be generated because usually you have them or you have them not this is a more random matter kind of thing mm, if you're mm. not a nun or a yes. uh, Zen master or something and uh, even they don't have it always and um, so therefore uh, I came across the option that drugs might be helpful to uh, to induce these kind of experiences and uh, I was lucky enough to have <clears throat> such an uh, psilocybin induced experience early mm. on mm. Uh, which was also a mystical experience a full-blown mystical experience it might have been kind of a revival of what I've experienced before yes. and at that point I had the very deep intuition that my life will be devoted to the mystical experience or exploring the mystical experience mm. the mystical realm um, as well as uh, psychedelic drugs very interesting. So how old were you when that first mystical experience fishing happened? I think happened? I was kind of 18. 18. Yeah. How, how rigid was your mind by 18? Because you say you were an atheist. Yeah. Would you say, would you describe yourself as someone who, who really did need to, to box things up in a way that we might associate with uh, someone who likes mechanism, you know, and analysis. Yeah, exactly. So I was uh, not very much in contact, on contact with my feelings. Mm. And I was also having this typical kind of adolescent crisis where mm. you don't know who you are and mm. your identity is still something you have to figure out and so on. And uh, therefore, I think um, uh, I got very much irritated because I was already in a kind of labile uh, kind of state and uh, we are looking out for where are the fragments of my identity and, and that process made me uh, very, um, how should I say, very open but at the same point of time very fragile. Mm. This state of suggestibility that psychedelics mm -hmm. put people into and, and the fact that they can disorient someone you yeah. know, at, at this fundamental level which, which I really think at one level needs to be referred to with, with mystical language, with mm -hmm. well, metaphysical language, you know. Mm -hmm. um, changing that around for someone, what does that mean for uh, not only what they think about the world, but importantly how they're going to act in it, how they're going to treat other people, what yeah. influence they're going to have on other people, and what that ultimately means for society. But uh, before I suppose we can really talk about that properly, uh, you'd have to have a conversation about you know, yeah. what, what society is and, and what have you. So okay, 
So, so you have this experience um, and then you, you have the psychotherapy. What was it about the psychotherapy that helped integrate that experience for you? Yeah, one thing was that uh, we were elaborating partially on this experience mm -hmm. and uh, I made further experience during the course of the psychotherapy somewhat and uh, we also could integrate this experience and so at last I've uh, and it also helped me to overcome all these fragile fragility and mm -hmm. le mm -hmm. uh, uh, lebialness and, and these fragmented kind of things and it was very very helpful because usually if you are an adolescent uh, parents can't help you as effective in that respect so it's good if you have another person you have an intimate relationship with and which is really looking out for you and, and uh, um, can help you in you with your inner issues yeah was it was it a, a man and a woman did you know it was a man it was a man okay yeah. These days in psychotherapy, particularly yeah. when it comes to psychedelics, yeah. they have the man and the woman there. Yeah, yeah. Do you have thoughts about that and whether that's important? Yeah, it is important from an um, archetypical point of view because yeah. you have to have both, so yes. to say, as a usual thing. But uh, what is also on my mind is uh, that it was uh, produced, this kind of uh, setting, by uh, cases of abuse, uh, sexual abuse, uh, with people in the early work with MDMA in the early 1980s uh, mm -hmm. when they had two cases which are widely known, became widely known and uh, there are some issues with uh, kind of um, making people more open by these drugs, more labile, which can be helpful in therapeutic processing but it can be also helpful in uh, producing abuse you know, seducing the therapist to abuse the patient. Mm. Another aspect is also that uh, sometimes, especially if it comes to MDMA, if you give MDMA to a patient, uh, to a patient, he might get rid of his neurotic fears mm -hmm. for some hours, and so you would see. Uh, you get a, comp get a completely other impression from the other person. He might uh, show up as a completely lovely individual with a lot of potentials and stuff like that. So you might fall in love, in fact, with the patient because of seeing him in a completely different fashion. And so there is a certain specific risk involved about these kind of things. And I think uh, having a couple there, there, there installs a lot of social control Mm -hmm. about these kind of issues and therefore they don't come up for me where that links up with in a in another tangential way and we will rescue the thread is just that when you engage in in the kind of uh, vulnerable a vulnerable relationship with someone way where, where you are speaking well authentically to that place of vulnerability and then with an attitude towards change with with the potential for health mm -hmm. there's a bit of creativity involved in mm -hmm. that you know it is it, it seems to me at least like that something similar to that mechanism is what's involved in developing a, mm -hmm. a genuine romantic relationship mm -hmm. you know and it's um you have to it, it's, it's quite it's quite interesting to watch that in yourself as you go about life in general because because you, you might want to be a very honest person and engage with yeah. with with those kind of interactions and to it and, and and ultimately you should be an honest person and mm -hmm. otherwise you pervert your relationship to being and it all mm -hmm. goes terribly bloody wrong for you but but there is still there is still appropriate places within then to be guarded in a certain way if mm -hmm. you want to protect yourself or part of something that is unconscious in you so from a man's perspective if you're going yeah. to be Jungian about it that animal you know getting too mm -hmm. attached to a particular individual you have to you have to be you have to you do have to watch out to, to what it is you are latching you are latching onto and I, I can totally understand how in a therapeutic setting mm -hmm. uh, you've got a psychodynamic there that um, yeah you have to watch out for it's very very interesting mm -hmm. yeah so okay so you have um so you have the the psychotherapy as a as a between 18 and 21-ish yeah. um now what about the philosophical side of you because of course you might have had a probably quite a let's say as an 18 year old if i think back to what yeah. i was doing a very naive attitude yeah. towards the world we could maybe call it a naive materialism yeah. of course in the 20th century you have behaviorism very much in vogue um so what was it that 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 intellectually or philosophically uh, gave you the new grounding or a new space to explore in that you could place the context mm -hmm. of your attitude towards the yeah. world in? So it, uh, it somewhat deepened my understanding as a consequence, but not out of the experience itself, it more indirectly because I dig deeper and I had a much more broader scope. 
And uh, I don't know if that was induced by these mystical experiences, but um, uh, I uh, have very concise, 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 concise. thoughts. Yes. And as uh, and also concise writing. Yes. And elaborations about things, but I uh, kind of uh, tend to stay away from a certain point of view. It means I'm not a materialist, I'm not an idealist, I'm not a dualist. I respect all these approaches, but I don't have to hang on one yes. of them. Yes. This is uh, I don't know <clears throat> how I became <clears throat> that much detached of the, from that. But it is a more general attitude in my mind, and um, I was also um, um, fought by people because of that, because mm -hmm. they want to make me say something, oh, I'm a dualist, I'm this, I'm believing in uh, afterlife and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I, my personal approach as a psychiatrist, psychotherapist, psychologist, philosopher is more like uh, I respect that humans have the experience of telepathy. If it's right. real or not, it doesn't matter to me. So my research is limited to the experience. And so we can look out, for example, if uh, gymnastic teachers have more OBEs than others, mm. for example, because they have a more awareness of their body scheme and stuff like that. Out of you know, experience. yeah, we, 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 can, uh, if, uh, we can find out a lot by just exploring the experience. We don't have to talk about if it's real or not, but the people tend to have these simple things like mind over matter. That's mm. an old debate, you know. Mm. There is some influence of the mind, there is some influence on the matter. Mm. So where's the problem? <laughs> I mean, you don't have to be so much polarized, right? Yes, I do understand where you're coming from. As someone who uh, has engaged in a bit of philosophy of mind, mm -hmm. I suppose it is an interest of mine to try and be as clear as possible about what we mean by matter and mean by mind. And, uh, and um, well, perhaps we can get into that later. I am quite influenced by, I suppose, the process philosophers, Bergson, Whitehead, but also Peter. Peter, our friend, Peter yeah. Shusteds. People will have seen him on the podcast. Uh, so some variety of panpsychism. Um, it's quite, quite interesting to me, yeah. um, you know, uh, and, and the reason for that as well is because, because I do find the psychological fact, the experience, mm -hmm. so important yeah. um, oh, that in actual fact, well, when you follow it, when you follow it deep, I mean, as, as, as Jung did, the line all of a sudden between psychological fact and perhaps metaphysical process, mm -hmm. it does begin to blur in an interesting yeah. way if you accept certain metaphysical yeah. things. And I, I do quite like, I do feel a, a resonance with pursuing an integration of Jung and, mm -hmm. and the more process philosophy yeah. approach. And it, I think it might bear fruit, but okay, okay. So there's, there's a few things I, I definitely know I want to cover with you today. Yeah. The first, I suppose, is to speak to where we are at currently, right now. We're upstairs, backstage, at Beyond yeah. Psychedelics conference. Um, and it's, it's been a very interesting few days. Uh, sometimes, sometimes threatening to be too interesting, but not quite. Yeah. Always, always <laughs> interesting in a way I could manage. Almost every interaction you have with someone, you know, is, is quite profound. Yeah. Uh, people are very, very switched on, yeah. um, very interested in, in the mind and, and, and metaphysics. Yeah. But what's also interesting to me and what I will ask you about yeah. is, is the general attitude and movement and intention of the collective of people that are brought here. In your, from your perspective, what is the, where do you see this psychedelic community? What is, what is, what is, what is, their, what is the dominant attitude towards psychedelics? Like what is driving people's interest here, do you think? Um, you have different um, patterns going on. I think uh, one is that you have freaky adolescents, mm. uh, always. Mm. I mean, even uh, 3,000, 30,000 years ago, they had these kind of uh, identity-seeking, uh, uh, irritated individuals in this adolescent phase, let's say 15 to 25, kind of. And the people are much more open to kind of new experiences, maybe even visionary experience, psychedelics and so on. If you look at the uh, tribes in the former times or isolated in Brazil or where, wherever, uh, you will see that the people are much more having much more affinity to have these new and 
maybe irritating experiences yes. to to clear up where they have to go, what their personal paths will be and stuff like that. So you have that segment always. We had that uh, since the 1960s, it was more explicit, but we have that since that time. Mm. You know, maybe not as much in the former Eastern European countries, which are catching up right now but um, um, in a lot of other countries and so it is kind of natural that the people look out or search for these kind of uh, experience irritating experiences that's one part I think it's a big part of it yes, yes. Uh, as yesterday on the fireplace I've seen these kind of people yes, yes. and um, but on the other side you have uh, uh, much more matured people which are kind of 35 to 55 or something yes. and they have a more elaborate interest in the topic, uh, which is much more fundamental in that sense that they got influenced by their experiences. Mm. Um, and you also have a lot of uh, people which uh, kind of having, having uh, thoughts and attitude like uh, somebody might call uh, naive utopianism, mm. like, oh, we can be a lovely community, blah, 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 you know, but, uh, kind of dissolving boundaries so far that there are the differences become blurred mm -hmm. kind of uh, and uh, what I realize um, you might do that uh, more easily as a physician because if you believe that the people you see represent humanity then you might think oh everybody's ill because the doctor is just consulted if the persons are ill if you are working 10 hours in a clinic you see 10 hours ill people you might think okay everybody's ill this is not true this is a kind of perceptual selection bias and uh, this is also true for these tiny psychedelic conferences so there's just one conference this year explicitly designed for representing psychedelics psychedelic research humanity human sciences about psychedelics this is here so we are out of five billions i think uh, we have a few hundred here so mm -hmm. we have to be careful that we don't take this tiny little bit for a new wave or something like that but on the other side what we uh, reach right now kind of unexpectedly is that uh, psychedelics may uh, have a, a, a revival in psychiatry mm. and that might lead to some consequences because what we have seen uh, through the studies during the last 10 years is that even the mystical experience which is really alien to our uh, countries um, and the, the masses mm. uh, might be helpful in treating depression and if that's true uh, mystical experience might become quite more popular yes. that's a possibility and if we look more neutrally at them we might realize that they are very worthful experiences and that a lot of people should have access to them mm. and not this kind of random like I had by chance yes. uh, thing and that might lead in the long run to a more uh, open attitude about these experiences and might be even help to integrate these kind of experiences much more in our culture which also implies much more people having them. Yes. There's another side, there's many sides to the psychedelic world. Yeah. And one side that I know is a particular interest of yours is the microdosing side of psychedelics. Yeah. And microdosing is where you take a subperceptual dose of yeah. psychedelics. Now, yeah. people have different attitudes about this. So my first yeah. question would be, what are the dominant attitudes that you see arising in the culture about the use of microdosing different yeah. psychedelics? Yeah, so uh, one thing is that uh, you can't inspire uh, the usual population uh, doing that. Uh, because it's still an illegal scheduled substance. Absolutely. Uh, there, are, m there might be s some risks induced yep. and uh, people are, will be skeptical anyway. So we are talking about the uh, psychedelic user population, which is already using these uh, kind of things. And uh, I think um, there are a lot of aspects about that. One is, uh, or one major aspect is that you can take a psychedelic on a more regular basis, mm -hmm. 
without having all these irritating, distracting effects. And so therefore a lot, lot of people think, oh, I can do LSD without getting uh, the risk of being fragmented or getting on a horror trip or, or getting a mystical experience. You know, it's a kind of risk minimization in the uh, understanding of the people. That's one aspect. Uh, another aspect is that these substances might do something to the human organism which might be good uh, even if we don't dose them so much that we have these psychological uh, alterations. That this, it, from a pharmacological point, and I'm a pharmacologist too, um, uh, this might be possible, but this is, there's up to now no reliable ab evidence to my eyes that it is really the case. This is not uh, that all the reports are not true, but they are still anecdotal, might have been placebo induced and so on. So we still don't know exactly from a scientific point of view if this is really a method which can uh, alter whatever kind of thing uh, like uh, creativity, creative thinking, uh, stuff like that. What we know is you can't alter creative thinking or your thoughts or your thought patterns if you are not doing a dose which is altering your thought patterns. If you use a dose which is sub-perceptual, it means you can't detect it and so you can't detect changes in your thoughts. So this is beyond the definition. What I would like to introduce here is um, that uh, uh, when I have written the recent book, which I have written about my, as a science of microdosing, Is that what it's called? Uh, I came across a, a kind of 50 studies in the past which have been done with very low doses. Nobody knows about that. The whole internet is free of that. There's wow. no knowledge and this is how the internet can generate illusions because the people don't look at the past anymore. They are just in the now. Mm. which is mindful but maybe idiotic in another sense Absolutely. that they ignore the past and they don't know about. And what we know from these early studies is that above 20 micrograms you get a certain kind of effect which might in some rare cases in, uh, behave in a way that people might become a little more creative but I would bet that because of individual sensitivities about the substance, even if we would dose them with a uh, quality known and purity known stuff and could give everybody 20 micrograms or let's say 30 or something, yes. uh, they uh, would still have completely different reactions somewhat. And so therefore it's very hard to dose in the realm what I call above 20 micrograms where you get some kind of effect. Yeah, I would like to call that mini dosing coming from 20 to 50. And uh, a lot of the people which have microdosed in the past, for example, Albert Hofmann, the discoverer of LSD, yes. has done in a more or less erratic fashion, let's say five to seven times a year at maximum, uh, he did 30 to 90 mi micrograms. And that is quite a different deal. Yes, I mean, totally. then you have some effects. It's not a full-blown experience. Yes. We know from recent research that the full-blown LSD experience uh, uh, needs 200 micrograms. Then you have the full-blown effects. If you go lower, you have less effects. It's not a bad thing. It might be even good, but we still have to define where, what micro-dosing in that sense is. Yes, it's really tough, isn't it? I mean, um, it's tough to get a grip on what the full LSD experience would really be. I mean, do you mean to refer to the peak breakthrough mystical experience? It's no, vague no, in a no, way. No, no, uh, it's, no. It's just that we know from the questionnaire profiles yes. and from clinical experience that you don't get much more if you get a higher dose and you get somewhat less if you take a lower dose. Mm. So we know that uh, all the responses on these questionnaires, they got maximum activated when you have that kind of dose and you got much less if you get lower doses. Okay. So, but that doesn't mean, uh, like with a car, you can run 200 miles, let's say with a uh, sports car, but you usually run 50. Mm. Right, And so the speed of 50 is much more usable for you in the average day mm -hmm. than running 200. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Yes. So it doesn't mean yes. that 100 micrograms 
for example, can do a lot in respect to psychotherapeutic processing, uh, which might you, uh, which might be not as optimal with a full dose. Yes. And so, therefore, I'm not discriminating lower dosages or something. Yes. Like no. Absolutely. I mean, it's it. One thing for me that that I that I. I'm not quite seeing as much in conversation about psychedelics um, is really what the fundamental aim is, whether, whether it's for an individual's life or a collective. Now, people are talking about that. It's, it's not like people aren't interested in, in, in aims, of course. Um, and as far as therapeutic goals go, well, obviously, it's, it's, uh, it's dealing with trauma in such a way that it no longer holds back the individual and causes them some degree of suffering. It's, it's, it's integrating that in such a way that something can be learned from there so that they don't mm -hmm. repeat the same cycle of, of, of bad behavior. It dehabituates, you know, it can take yeah. away the, the negative self-narrative. And that's all, that's all good, right? Like, you can understand how if someone's got a, a wound there in a physiological sense mm -hmm. we can roughly help it out but but in terms of in terms of really um, patterns of behavior to, to aim mm -hmm. at in life that that are that are good uh, well I guess that the point I'm making is that the experience you're going to have on psychedelics is in part determined by how you are actually living mm -hmm. and what you are doing not only what your intention is for the day if it's writing if it's you know, if you want to have a, if you're going to do a, an exam and you take a really high dose of LSD, mm -hmm. it's going to be tough for you to maintain the right kind of yeah. coherence often. So obviously there's certain tool for a time and place. Um, but I guess what does concern me, I suppose, is, is exploration uh, for exploration's sake at when that exploration isn't fundamentally in an important sense grounded to something vital in the home that itself is the base from which the very image of what to move towards is projected. So it's kind of a Jungian idea, the idea of the God image, which mm -hmm. in one sense is a uh, combination of the conscious and unconscious psychic life, mm -hmm. but in another sense, um, the, the, I guess the, the grounds from which the, the, the image of, a, of, of, of what is missing in the psyche or or what is missing in the individual is projected into the future and is, mm -hmm. is the goal to which individuation moves. Like you can't really have movement without a goal, otherwise it's sort of static and, like, sorry, it's sort of chaotic. So I know that this is a fairly, I'm, I'm sort of throwing things out here, but, but what I'm concerned with most of all is, is that what is good in our cultures is involved in coordinating to some degree, our aims for mm -hmm. using psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Is that, I mean, uh, am I making myself somewhat clear with at least the importance of thinking about things this way? Does it seem like an, a, a, a helpful way of mm -hmm. thinking? So, um, if, it, if it comes to uh, what also might be called after uh, or with, uh, with um, uh, Abraham Maslow, the self-actualization, mm -hmm. it has some, some parallels to the individuation process a la Jung. Yes. Uh, but um, I would think that you can have different um, approaches in that respect. Uh, so if you, for example, expand your consciousness by a psychedelic substance, you might become aware of realms of yourself, your relationships and your self-actualization process or your individuation process, yes. which you might have neglected before. That could be one thing. So that could be potentially enriching if you can integrate the re uh, in a responsible way, you can integrate these parts which you have had neglect neglected before. But it also uh, uh, heightens your responsibilities. Mm. You have to think about that. The other thing is, if you are not becoming conscious of your neglect because you're using the drug to avoid realizing your, your neglects. Mm. And we see that somewhat more than the appropriate uh, uh, way to handle these kind of experiences and to allow them. So there's also something which Hans Karl Leuner, the, the major pioneer of psycholytic therapy in the 1960s uh, until the 80s, um, he said to me when I learned with him, he said, you know, we have sometimes these patients which um, have these 
avoiding enjoyment. So they enjoy the experience by avoiding the problematic part of it. They avoid their neglects, they avoid their dark sides, they avoid insights into their relationship problems, and so on and so on. And so in the psychedelic culture, in fact, if you look at these partially crude settings where the people take the drugs, it's mostly music and a lot of outside stimuli so that they don't come to a meditative attitude where you can evaluate yourself maybe from a higher kind of perspective of the higher self or so, so that you really can make conclusions and having insights and, and experiences which really broaden your scope. Mm. You know, a lot of times, for example, if you have an um, a t Tibetan uh, Klangschalen, these, these um, uh, Tibetan uh, bells, Tibetan you know, bells. going, uh, going yes. on, you know, it gives you a very smooth sound, you know, this is completely different if it comes to your personal attention about yourself, that might be helpful, but if you hear, for example, a tape with Jimi Hendrix, uh, you might put your attention only on the lead guitar. So it's a completely different deal. And this is why a lot of people, I would say, 80% of the users of psychedelics don't profit from the experience as, as much because they use it in a very extroverted way and having a lot of stimuli from the outside, having open eyes. They don't go, they simply don't go inside, so they avoid the inside, which is the original purpose to do psychedelics, but we also have to be tolerant about uh, ecstatic experiences in general. So they generate ecstatic experiences, but without uh, realizing what they can do uh, with themselves on the drugs. Let me just finish these thoughts with <clears throat> one thing. Uh, kind of 10 years ago, they interviewed the major techno DJ uh, in Germany. Okay. And at the last point in the interview, they said to him, uh, is there anything you want to say to the people from your side and from your heart? And he said, yeah, the essence is uh, take MDMA at home, close your eyes, have a place in bed, <clears throat> and hear soft music. This is my recommendation. Because this kind of exp inner experience, what you can get from MDMA, for example, or even LSD, mm. <clears throat> they avoid by having these uh, very loud and stimulating uh, outside stimuli dominated settings. Yes, very, very interesting, very interesting. Let me, let me try and get at this idea which you've helped illuminate slightly. It's, I guess what I'm trying to do is actually work through something I can't articulate properly, but mm -hmm. we are here where yeah. we are. So, and, and, and the idea is that, well, it would, be to, it would be to speculate as to why people might be resistant to really look within. Um, and now, of course, there is a lot to say here, and I don't mean to encapsulate it all. I mean to, I mean to speak to a, a small fragment of it. Um, and that would be that, you know, there are lots of things about how we live and how we process that can appear arbitrary if you become disoriented from the deeper patterns of action that they are actually involved in supporting. You know, um, an experience I had not long ago, and this is an extroverted experience, I suppose, to some degree, um, but I was walking along and, um, and there was a guy driving his car, you know, and it was an old, quite beautiful car but I'm sure he was doing the same old things that everybody else does with cars, you know, use it to get from home to work, mm -hmm. and he's got dinner later on, and then he goes about his day. And there I am on LSD, sort of disoriented from uh, uh, the, at least the uh, uh, phenomenally present realization of the normal way to be, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you, you see things for their slightly arbitrary mm -hmm. nature. And the concern might be it to, to to make this more, slightly more mystical and psychological than I can properly speak to, is that, well, I think people sometimes mistake, in some cases, the necessary actions that we do to keep society functioning, to keep our lives working, because we do actually have uh, important cares, whether it's to, to, to maintain the health of our family or ourselves or, or our community. We are 
agents in a grander pattern um, of collective behavior that needs to function in a certain way to continue mm -hmm. not falling into chaos. And, and the concern is that sometimes when you look within even, yeah, it should be fine. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You lose orientation to, mm -hmm. to the thing you really, you really shouldn't. And then mm -hmm. people suddenly feel like, oh, I'm off. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, it's, it's okay to be decentralized. Or oh, that's all bad. That's all yeah. stupid. Why are we doing it? You know, and I wonder, I wonder if that's because in some sense we are detached from uh, ultimately a symbolic relationship, some kind of deeper symbolic relationship to our culture. Let me check on that camera though. Okay, Torsten, we are back. Minor technical difficulty, difficulties okay. again. Yeah. Uh, uh, where my mind is at now has gone from uh, well, I suppose <laughs> it's mainly at burgers. Um, we've been talking about some burgers here. They're charging a little bit too much, actually, in my opinion. But it's fine. I mean, people have got to make their money. So I was talking about the concern I have when psychedelic experience uh, can, to an individual, reveal a kind of arbitrary nature to some of our beliefs and actions and then also sometimes throw the baby out with the bathwater mm -hmm. in respect of the ultimately vital and living and important grander structure of patterns of behavior that are good that those ideas or that those experiences can jar against. So you can comment on that if you like, or I suppose you can tell me about anything you have in particular uh, to say about what people should be wary of in psychedelic experience when they look within and perhaps talk about why it is that sometimes people don't mm -hmm. wish to engage in their yeah. inner life. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, I'll start by, by um, uh, going on uh, something what you mentioned, uh, which is um, uh, that people don't have the usual concepts in their mind when they are on a psychedelic drug. And I think that is a uh, really under-researched area of uh, psychedelic experiences that uh, because the brain is somewhat irritated, you don't have your usual conceptual knowledge available to evaluate things in the outer world. And, uh, but it also frees you somewhat from the concept so you can see much more of the things you, you see mm. because you're not kind of putting concepts onto them. Okay, this is a bird of this kind, this is that person, this is a camera and so on. You can look with much more a kind of open mind or open perception at things because you don't connect them too much to your uh, previous experience by using con concepts to to evaluate them or or to to get uh, hold of them yes. and or to to see what purpose they have or if they are dangerous or not and stuff like that this can be very interesting to to be beyond human concepts and then c there can be even a much deeper kind of perception going on what you can realize when you uh, encounter an animal on a psychedelic drug i mean if you are on a psych under the influence of a psychedelic drug like LSD or so, mm -hmm. then you are beyond your, your, your usual concept. That means you might not perceive a wild pig in the forest as a danger, which in, it, usually it, it, it is not a real danger. Right. But people are anxious about them. They think, oh, they are wild. We are not wild. So we, we must, uh, must have been anxious and, or we, we, we have to be anxious about uh, the danger which is coming from that animal. So if you are under the influence of LSD, for example, and the wasp would, would sit down your, on your nose, you are not anxious. You would look it up and say, oh, an interesting animal. Hey, man, I've never seen something yeah. so near and stuff like that. So you, you are uh, potentially in much, much more respect of the other creatures because you are not determined to look out for your survival. Like, is it a danger or can I, can I eat it? Mm -hmm. You know, like these kind of categorizing is beyond your scope. And that means you're looking much more at the animal life as it is represented in this species as it is in you. 
And so you see much more commonalities in between the species and even might be with the plants and the mushrooms, you know, uh, than uh, dissimilarities or uh, you, you, you're not into using the world, you're much more into perceiving the world uh, and you would see much more connectedness and commonalities that way. And I think it is very important that under research that we go beyond concepts. Uh, even the, all the neuropsychological experiments are much more to look at is your intelligence score going down, mm -hmm. uh, are you having less uh, selective attention, stuff like that, you know. But the interesting thing is that you get rid of selective attention because you get rid of your concepts. So if you think, oh, this, this light there might be a car, so you are looking at it coming and then you realize, oh yeah, it has a trunk, it has uh, another light and you know has has all these features so your perception is kind of and your attention is kind of guided by your concepts mm -hmm. and so if you get rid of the concept you might also have another kind of attention which is much more broad in scope and takes much more things into as significant as it would have been if you are tightened to your concepts and you got a much smaller realm of evaluating things and perceiving things. So it would seem to me that there's a positive component to that experience, but also a negative component mm -hmm. as well. Do you, do you recognize positives and negatives with that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, for example, there's one example which I uh, like to quote, which was um, an experience my girlfriend had uh, tens of years ago. Uh, they were sitting together having an LSD trip. I think there were five people. And one guy was playing a guitar, uh, an acoustic guitar, and he didn't have a plectron. He used a, a piece of a broken uh, bottle right and so by chance he uh, opened his artery in the uh, in the forearm and uh, the blood was uh, uh, flowing. Uh, flowing out there and it was an immediate uh, life-threatening danger yes. but the other people were looking at him and said oh man what a nice color what a nice thing is going on there oh. you know they were not into their concepts yeah. about dangerous and it's an artery and that can be and so on and so they didn't call up anybody they didn't even help him for wow. a while at a certain point they realized, okay, there is something wrong and this guy hold his hand there and stuff and so they helped him and he was rescued. But the first minutes they didn't realize what would happen there. Yes. And this can be dangerous, dangerous, but if you are in a protected environment, uh, it shouldn't be a problem because yes. if you would just have uh, um, matrices lying around and stuff like that, so I mean, yes. where should be the danger coming from? Right. It might come from your own inner space that yes. could be aggression or something like that. But these are very rare occasions and yes. if they show up in uh, therapeutic setting settings, you can easily handle these kind of things as yes. a therapist. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. So that's a good example of, of a danger of the sort of external world um, I suppose yeah. uh, but what about when someone is looking within um, and I guess the immediate uh, or the, the ordinary function of how you relate to yourself is, is changed we talk about ego dissolution and I mean there's lots of different ways to think about that one might be that there's an almost to there can be an almost total annihilation of what it is to uh, usually <laughs> relate yourself to yourself Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. and so, but experience remains, and and you will encounter images. Yeah. And I use that term very broadly. But um, could you talk to perhaps what it is to gaze inward from that space where uh, your ordinary relation to concepts mm -hmm. changes, and then but also talk to. What, what the pitfall might be, like what is the resistance people have to looking within mm. there, because we know not everybody okay, does. Okay, these are two big questions. So the first thing is that um, these drugs were immediately called uh, consciousness expanding by mm -hmm. early researchers mm -hmm. already. And we know that from the shamans that they also have a kind of view on the substances like, okay, it expands your capacity to perceive yourself. And um, it is not just that you put your attention inward, you could do that with meditation or other things too, which might become therapeutic in that sense too, in some cases. But uh, what the difference is with the psychedelics to my eyes is that a psychedelic 
stimulate the brain and that means that they even if there are some regions which are not having as much blood as usual and that irritates the brain too the general consensus is that you have an, um, a very much increase of inner stimuli production and so all these kind of dreamlike states what the people experience are coming from this increase of production of inner stimuli mm -hmm. and i think uh, with this kind of daydream like flow of uh, imagery yes. and experiences you can experience much more of yourself but but there is a certain uh, threatening thing in that too because you don't know in which kind of corner of yourself you will land at last and what you will confront and this is especially what i like because uh, then you don't uh, suggest so much to the patient. It's more like a process which he is doing by himself with some support of you. So if it comes to hypnosis, for example, you are much more suggestive, you are much more potentially manipulative. And your concepts guide the experience, stuff like that. And with uh, psycholytic therapy or psychedelic therapy, you are not really impregnating the person and you're not really guiding. You're more kind of a moderator. You are kind of helper. In some cases, you might say, okay, it's better if you stay on your mattress, if the person is uh, tending to stand up uh, in a dysfunctional fashion, so then you help him. And in other things, you can converse with him, you can calm him down, stuff like that, but let the inner process happen. This is a kind of paradigm in psycholytic and psychedelic therapy. Mm. So don't intervene as much. And I, this is very much what I like about this kind of therapeutic work, that the healing is coming from within. I even called it that way, the healing from coming from within. You know, and that means you're just a moderator. This is also where uh, you can see there is a kind of distinction between the psycholytic psychedelic therapists. One try to tend uh, to further their narcissism means, oh, I'm the healer, I'm the guy who is directing the experience, I'm the guy who is giving the substances, I'm semi-god, and stuff like that, and the others become through experience uh, with, a ther with therapeutic work, they become more and more humble and realize that the people heal, mainly heal themselves and we are just moderating self-healing capacities. Yes, very, very interesting. So um, is it part of your role to sit in on the administration of psycholytic therapy? Yeah, I have done that quite a lot and uh, I'm still doing it occasionally, yes. but uh, we, now, we are now approaching the stage of um, the psychedelic revival where we are doing uh, therapeutic studies and so in the near future we will be able to sit again in legal settings. Yes. Uh, but I have done that already with Hans Karloiner and with the Swiss guys which had this per permit in the early uh, 1990s. And so I have uh, uh, a lot, uh, gathered a lot of experience with yes. uh, sitting with patients. Yes. yes, that's really very interesting. Have you been, well, have you been influenced at all by um, Stan Groff's work? Yeah, uh, definitely so, especially in the beginning, because it was uh, giving you a more broader outlook on uh, the experiences you can get. Uh, in the, but in retrospect, I would say it was already there by other researchers, but much more dispersed in the literature. Yes. Um, and so he put it together and he also came from the psycholytic uh, approach which was more inspired by psychoanalysis and lower dosages in serial sessions yes. and so we had uh, very much knowledge of both approaches the psychedelic approach with one or two doses and high, high doses and inducing life transforming mystical experiences and as well as with the psycholytic approach he also was ideal to give us a more broad a picture of the psychedelic or psycholytic uh, therapeutic processes because he was also part of two cultures, the American culture and the uh, Czech culture, yes. or the European culture in essence, and so therefore he was the ideal guy to put all uh, that together. He had also a, 
um, a very good education in the theory of science. Yes. And so, but uh, I have to confess that the later uh, work of him, I was not uh, as much impressed by, but this is not this is my personal thing. Yes. Uh, I think the first work was uh, most important to lay the groundwork for something like transpersonal psychology and respecting much more these life transforming aspects of the psychedelic experience. Okay, so that book, his first great major work is Realms of the Human Unconscious, yeah, exactly. that's correct. Yeah, it is, yeah. it is a really quite remarkable book actually for people who are curious about the LSD experience. Yeah. Um, there's uh, quite remarkable uh, accounts of some of his patients yeah. and also a very detailed analysis of the various stages yeah. or classes yeah. of kinds of experience yeah. as he sees them. Yeah. The, the problem for, uh, before was that uh, a lot of the psychiatrists and psychotherapists were kind of shy to talk about these experiences even and uh, they were not able to conceptualize them and uh, not as comprehensively as, as Stan has done that and therefore he uh, kind of broke the way uh, for these uh, kind of uh, psychological experiences to be respected yes. and not uh, be called uh, psychotic or um, uh, strange or alien or whatever. Yes. And uh, we also had um, uh, Hans Karl Neuner, for example, was much more technical in his descriptions. Yes. And he, in his later years, he told me he had kind of underestimated the value of these more transpersonal-like or mystical and whatever kind of experiences. And they are therapeutically versatile, as we see right now with all the new trials. Yes, very interesting. Okay, so I know our time is drawing to a close together, which is, uh, which is a shame from my perspective, because yeah. I don't think I would ever have <laughs> a finite set of questions to ask yeah. you. There would always be more. It's been really enjoyable talking to you. So I'm just trying to think of ways that we could really provide value to people here. One would um, be to ask you what you would recommend for people to read or engage with uh, that you think gives the best introduction to, but then moving towards the potential for a comprehensive understanding of how to understand perhaps uh, modern psychiatry, psychology, but and where that intersects with psychedelics. Yeah, so uh, right now there's not so much out there which con conceptualizes these kind of relationships and so on. And we also have to realize that Stan Grove is out of science since 40 years. Mm. You know, he's more into conceptualizing things but uh, with not very much scientific foundation anymore. It's because of his uh, huge experience, he can conceptualize things without this scientific base of knowledge. And so therefore he can't be recruited for that purpose. And there are not so much people in the field right now, as far as I can see, which might be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so we will, it will be an interesting time to see how psychiatry might integrate these new approaches which are in fact very old because we were in charge of uh, cathartic procedures in the former times, 100 years ago. They used that much more in psychotherapy and psychiatry, mm -hmm. but they, they changed their mind to have less feelings as our culture tends to be, to be more, be more rational, to have less feelings. And for example, psychoanalysis was gone away from affectivity and appreaction and catharsis because of not uh, of not coming too near to the patient to become too empathic which might be fall in love at last uh, these kind of things so they stayed away from appreaction and more feelings and i think that we there will be also a revival of feelings as healing powers mm. in psychiatry and it is not so easy to educate these these, how should I say, old-fashioned or uh, the, the psychiatrists of today uh, to educate them to allow more feelings, to allow more openness about the inner processes which might be activated by psychedelic drugs. And therefore, I think there is a huge skepticism which we will confront in the future, even if some people are interested in these kind of things. But yes. there is a lot of resistance we have to go over in the future. Okay, okay. So perhaps you might like to say a few words about your upcoming book. Uh, I know this conversation yeah. will be released around, well, it will be released at yeah. the appropriate time for yeah. the release of that book. Yeah. Um, so uh, who should be interested in it? Uh, what's its name? 
Yeah. And um, yeah, anything so you'd like to say about it? So it's right now called uh, The Science of Microdosing. That's yes. a book about microdosing. And uh, it gives you a comprehensive overview about all we know about. Because I'm, uh, I shouldn't say that, but it's true. Uh, I'm one of the leading experts in respect to the pharmacology of LSD. I have written a book with Oxford University Press about yes. the pharmacology of LSD. And I really comprehensively know all the literature about it and yes. all the facts. And so therefore, it might be interesting, especially especially for scientists and for the serious potential microdoses to know about the history, because I'm a historian too, I'm into these, uh, elaborating these matters too, uh, but I'm also into pharmacology and digging up all these little tiny studies which have been done in the past. Mm. And I also can contextualize that with the recent knowledge what we gained about LSD. I might also mention that we recently founded the International Medical Psychological Society for Substance Assisted Psychotherapy, which will be an institution um, uh, meant to, uh, to evaluate uh, therapeutic procedures, to provide guidelines, to do quality assurance uh, procedures and stuff like that, to find consensus about certain therapeutic uh, procedures and processes. Um, on an international level so yes. that we can kind of setting the standards and norms we have to take care of that because otherwise we will not be established and not come through in the established communities of psychiatrists and psychologists um, and um, so this would be an, uh, an important step and um, in connection to that I might mention that I'm actually writing another book right now which will be or which is intended to be the comprehensive textbook about uh, psycholytic and psychedelic uh, therapy and awesome. putting all uh, these effects together, even the most modern approaches and uh, the, all the neurobiology and so on and so on. And this is because of having a kind of multidisciplinary approach from yes. my way what I studied from social science to philosophy to psychology and then medicine and neurobiology. So uh, it is sometimes good if you have one person kind of sorry, knowing everything and put it together in a thing what, what is kind of straightforward and not having five contributions where you replicate uh, parts here and yes. you repeat that there and so on. It, it has to be more kind of out of one uh, um, uh, feather, so yes. to say. Yeah. No, beautiful. That's, that's super interesting. I look forward to both of those books. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I definitely will read yeah. them. Um, Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Uh, shake my hand, please. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really been a pleasure, yeah. Torsten. Yeah. I will have all the links to uh, both where you can get to the upcoming book, uh, get in touch with everything Torsten's touched on there, in the show notes uh, on the website, and also in the description in YouTube. Thank you very much, yeah. everyone. And uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, you very much for being such a noble intellectual. Oh, thank you. My name's Tim Adeline, by the way. I never actually uh, say who I am, but apparently that's important if you want to build a bloody brand. So yeah. I'm going to do that. <laughs> thank you very much, Torsten. Thank you, everyone. You put that in front of us, right? What's that? That's your last sentence. You put yeah. that in front of us.